In general, there's a 10-year action plan, as we know, for the audiovisual sector. And under this plan, there's a steering group uh, which will oversee the 200 million investment in taxpayers' money and which is targeted at this sector in the National Development Plan. And we'll also look at funding models and regulatory reforms and other supports and general oversight. Um, just Deputy Boyd Barrett and other deputies as well have, have mentioned training, Deputy Burton, Deputy O'Snudig, and I think Deputy Collins also. And earlier this year, Screen Ireland set up a subcommittee of its board to oversee training. It also employed a new director of its training division, which is called Screen Skills Ireland. And in the government's audiovisual action plan, which was published last June, there are a significant number of recommendations and actions to be undertaken in the area of training, including the matching of skills with production growth and partnering with third level institutions in skills development. But also the, the unrest uh, that has been mentioned in the film industry at the moment, I'm acutely aware of that. I welcome any suggestions by any of the deputies in a way that we can remedy it. As we know, there are inter-union rivalry issues there at the moment, which is stymieing any progress. Uh, and, but it's very important that we get to the bottom of these issues. And it doesn't, to my mind, seem seemly to have worker representatives arguing uh, or at loggerheads with each other on these matters. And as, as you, some of the deputies are aware, officials of my department uh, are available to meet with and, and do meet with all stakeholders in the industry about this. And last year at the International Consultants, uh, Oldsburg um, with Nordisti carried out 90 separate consultations and evaluated over 180 data sources and collected data through surveys for their report. There's a number of um, contributions in relation to section 481 um, and as we know this particular um, part of the Act excludes broadcasters from applying for the tax relief in their own right and a broadcaster has to partner uh, with an Irish company in order to qualify th for the relief. And a company must also have a record of being in the jurisdiction for 21 months in order to be paid relief. And this, in my mind, isn't an unreasonable provision uh, because it acts to protect the taxpayer. And in order to obtain tax relief under Section 481, each producer company is required to provide proposals to my department on their planned training to fulfil their requirement under, under Section 481 and the producer company must provide these in their application for the tax relief in advance of the project. And the department can accept the proposals or request changes. And in order to monitor the provision of training, each producer company is required to provide a return to the department on training within four months of the completion of the project. And this return must include the trainee name, the training role, the mentor role, the period of training, and the amount of compensation paid to the trainee. And the information provided to my department is for the purpose of monitoring compliance with the conditions of the award of tax relief under Section 481 uh, of the Act. And it contains significant personal information as well, uh, which is subject to data protection requirements and it cannot be universally disseminated. Um, in relation to legal protections uh, for workers in the film industry, it's important to note that employees in every industry and, and sector, as I said last week, are entitled to all existing legal protections and um, I, as you all know uh, there is legislation being brought forward by my colleague Minister for Employment Affairs and Social Protection which is the Employment um, Bill 2017 which should improve the insecurity and predictability of working hours for employees on insecure contracts and those working variable hours and obviously employment law in general um, should also have a role to play in terms of existing legal protections and uh, there are also institutions for reporting abuse of employment uh, legis for, for reporting abuse of employment legislation but I should say that I am satisfied that the industry works uh, in general to a high standard and my department is working with all partners to ensure that all sectors of the industry comply with their obligations as much as we can um, also, the, the, I mentioned the audiovisual action plan, I think, that I launched last June, and there's a steering group to implement that plan. This is a whole-of-government approach to the audiovisual industry. Um, Deputy Burton, you mentioned female representation in the film industry. Screen Ireland is committing to addressing that issue, um, the issue of gender inequality in Irish filmmaking, and Screen Ireland um, is, is doing all it can to work towards achieving the target of 
50 50 uh, gender parity by 2020 in creative talent uh, working in screen content, content. And I know that there's been a significant increase of 62% in applications received with female talent uh, included, and an, also an 82% increase in funding awards with female talent attached in 2018 when we look at the in, in comparison to 2017 figures. Just on people working in the film industry in general, um, I know Deputy O'Snuddy and Boyd Barrett and Deputy Burton and I think Deputy Collins raised it as well. And my department has actually published additional information uh, which is now available on the audiovisual sector on the website in the form of a technical annex uh, to the audiovisual uh, report. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there was 90 separate consultations. Um, and obviously, you know, we have to make sure that, that you know, all of, all of that is taken into account. But the promotion of the Irish film industry in general is the responsibility of the Screen Ireland, which is formerly the Irish Film Board. And I think it's fair to say that it has undergone major change and development, uh, both domestically and internationally, um, in recent years. And it has a vision for a vibrant, creative and sustainable uh, Irish film, television and animation industry with diverse voices and uh, talent and opportunities. And uh, it has a number of A-list international festivals and markets where it promotes Irish film and Irish animation, as well as promoting Ireland as a location for internationally mobile film production. And we have um, the, the overall audiovisual action plan, which was um, launched last June. And the key points of the plan are the Section 48 uh, extension, uh, which, as we know, there was also a regional uplift of 5%. There's an increased business skills development, matching of the skills with production growth and partnering with third level institutions in skills development. Um, and it's important to say as well that the, the audio visual plan was, um, was underpinned by an economic assessment of the audio visual uh, industry by, by Nordicity and by the consultants. And they said that um, Ireland's film, television and animation sector could in a period of five years double employment to over 24,000 uh, full-time jobs and a gross value of nearly 1.4 billion. Uh, and I hope that that will happen. The loan facility was mentioned as well, I think by Deputy Boyd Barrett earlier on, and uh, I think Deputy Burton. Um, the assistance given by the government through its various agencies is usually by way of non-repayable grants. And um, Screen Ireland is unusual in that it awards grants by way of loans uh, which are repaid if and when the project is successful enough uh, to make a profit. And the repayment of any loan allows Screen Ireland to increase the level of loans given to projects. And this system of support operated uh, by Screen Ireland allows Irish Indigenous film and TV projects to be made which would not otherwise be made. And this means that profit isn't the only consideration uh, in the support of the audiovisual sector. And as is the case with some uh, statutory bodies that receive public funding, um, a limit was set by statute on such outlay, uh, in this case where the Irish Film Board Act uh, in 1980 was enacted, and that's why we have to change the limit um, from 300 million to 500 million. Um, but you all know that. I just, um, Deputy Boy Barrett uh, is right that we need we, we need good data to evaluate our investment in the audiovisual sector on an ongoing basis uh, and I, I mentioned that already and we're going to look at this in the context um, of the 10-year audiovisual action, action plan. Uh, I think I discussed broadcasters already. Um, there is a balance to be struck, I think, between, uh, they're not all international. Um, I know some international broadcasters have lobbied to have the broadcaster exclusion dropped, uh, but we'll, we'll examine this to see if there is a disincentive in that regard. Um, what else is there? Uh, the loans, training, yeah. Just in general terms, uh, Deputy Collins, you, you, you raised um, in relation to Screen Ireland and Section 481, they, they don't actually have any involvement uh, with Section 481. And Deputy Burton, you raised about the board appointments and the nomination of the board is subject to the guidelines uh, for, for the appointment of members to state boards if anyone wants to apply through the PASS system. Um, Deputy Collins raised it as well and 
the Board of Screen Ireland isn't a, a, a representative board, but it is skills based under the Act. And there are seven members um, under the Act, and this should probably be looked at as it, is, it probably is a very low number for a board. Um, but Screen Ireland has a robust policy on dealing with conflicts uh, of interest on its board as well, which I think is important to say. So I think that's most of it, uh, Ken Corla covered. No, no, we're not going back again. <laughs>